Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, as you said, I'm Dave Thera, senior project engineer, mechanical based with Wright Industries. I've been with the company over 21 years. Uh, we specialize in designing automation equipment, meaning that customers come to us with a product and they want to build X number of these per day, per hour, per year. We build the equipment that does that. Uh, what you're seeing in front of you is just a small screenshot of some, something one of our apps engineers decided to try and sell. Um, I'm going to give into, I'm going to go into a little bit deeper on who we are, what we do, our different departments that we have, and then towards the end of this, I'll show you a real life project that we have going on online right now. Now you got to forgive me, I'm not a speaker by any means, so I'm going to stumble around on this quite a bit. So please. Um, the next slides I'm going to be showing you are is pretty much our sales presentation that we have to our customers. We tend to sell to suppliers for automotive, uh, a lot of entertainment equipment, medical products, insulin-based pumps, insulin-type equipment. Uh, we're into the energy sector. Um, anybody that has anything that you use every day, we've probably built a part of it. We're owned by the Dorfer Corporation, um, two, two private owners, um, Sunder and Dave Takas. Uh, Wright Industries has been around for over 60 years. We're a Nashville-based company. Uh, we started out as a tool and die company and then got into automation and have progressed from there into um, automation for assembly, automation for process groups and things of that nature. So overall, you can see we have four U.S. sites, uh, one in Singapore and 700 plus employees. 300 of those are engineer staff alone. Our engineers run, range from mechanical engineers, uh, a lot of double E's, a lot of computer science, uh, a lot of vision-based equipment, uh, a little bit of civil here and there as we see it, but not much. Um, we've got sites in Nashville, Greenville, South Carolina, Waverly, Iowa, Singapore, and we got a couple others in other places in Iowa. I'm not truly really sure what, how many they've got now. As far as automation companies go, we are the largest in the states. There are other companies around the world a little bit bigger than us, but we are the biggest. We bring a lot of expertise to, the, to what we believe we can help, um, just because mostly we've been around so damn long. This slide here just shows you the different places that we have and different relationships we have with other countries in Europe um, and a couple others we have in Brazil and South America. We specialize in turnkey, well, turnkey manufacturing, meaning we will take it from the beginning to concept, working out what we believe it'll take. We'll supply all the manpower to build this, build, design the equipment. We will build the equipment in-house. We will test it off to the full requirements needed. We'll tear it all back down and then we'll reinstall it back in the site as needed and go through another full set of testing. And then support that as required. Let me get through some of this. This just gives you an idea of the things that we can do in-house or in one of our subsidiary companies. Um, clean room, barrier isolation. Uh, we do a lot of medical product companies, a lot of medical products. Uh, you wouldn't believe how much the insulin world itself and diabetics has brought to the manufacturing requirements or manufacturing needs. Um, so we get into a lot of clean room applications. We get into uh, hazardous chemicals, uh, especially when we start dealing with the process side where we're dealing with directly chemicals, piping, plumbing, and um, building of um, different threads and things of this nature. We have some process equipment that is nothing but threads. Um, we do a lot of um, lean scalable systems, meaning where it is something where mostly uh, you have manual operators working on stations, and if, as they need to increase the assembly work, they will add more stations as needed. In our end of it, we believe it's really low tech, because unless it's a full automation, we don't tend to deal with it too much. Um, along with that, we got the controls group that, that supports all the equipment. So you can imagine we've got a lot of robotics, a lot of service systems, vision systems. Uh, laser systems that all have to operate together. 
So we custom write all the program code to go with that. And it all has to be in a usable interface for the uh, operators. So not only are you designing for engineers to work with this, you're designing this for the everyday layman that's walking in off the street. So some of the areas we're into, custom automation assembly, which is where I tend to work at. Uh, packaging, I mean, material handling, packaging, assembly, process, and test equipment. And that goes from a wide range of type of products. Um, as I said before, we're into energy sector where we've done uh, solar cell work, done several pieces of equipment building solar cells, uh, was working on a scale, well not a scale factor, but a factory that was moved around the desert depending upon where they wanted to build these solar cells at. So it was a true factory that was taken up, taken down, and never had walls around it. Simply had a roof and a bunch of platforms you moved in. So we do things like that. Everything that we do is custom. So you'll see more diversity in five years of engineering at Rain Industries than you'll see anywhere else, just because of all the different technologies that we deal with. So you become a jack of all trades and sorts. You don't specialize in anything, good or bad. Uh, we also deal with the regulatory, uh, mostly in uh, nuclear reclamation, uh, vitrification of the nuclear waste. So this is all in the process of getting rid of the waste that your nuclear reactors make and then storing it somewhere on the ground. Uh, process automation is all textile mostly. As I was saying, we, we do a lot of work for the U.S. government for uh, developing and mach the machines that make the Kevlar thread that's used in all of the um, military-based equipment. Uh, press automation, material transports. So we do, a, we do a line of AGVs that's very large. These things are as large as this room. Uh, NASA uses them to move around rocket stages. And the, the key thing about these is they have multiple wheels. They have the ability to level themselves off at any given point. Uh, they can turn on a dime if needed. They have their own self-power plants built into them and custom tooled as they need to. Uh, so like I say, NASA's picking these up. We use them a lot of nuclear work because these, this nuclear vitrification, once you've took all this nuclear waste and you stuff it into something, what are you going to do with it? They bury it down in old salt mines out west. So to get those down in there, they'll load these on these AGVs and, load, and take them down through these salt tunnels to get them out. Uh, tool and die work, still into that a little bit. And then contract manufacturing, I meaning if a customer comes to us and has a design that they, they need to be built, it's already designed, we'll build the equipment for them. Just gives you a sector of what our diversification is. Like I said, as you can see, life sciences, 35% of what we do. It's definitely the lion's share. 10 years ago, that was mostly automotive. So with all of the diseases and diabetics and everything else we got in this country, in this world, you're gonna see that grow even more. Just gives you a, a quick map of where we have customers around the world. You see kind of little flags everywhere. Uh, just service and support. Go down through here. So this just takes us from that when we take on a project, we'll assign a team to that. That team will consist of a project manager, a uh, team of technical engineers, leads, and then the support staff to go with that. At the same time, we all as we get into the build phase, we'll bring our lead technicians in to begin taking that on too. But that team will stay with that project all the way through installation. Um, just show, we're just talking about some of the different types of engineering we do. A lot of 3D uh, analysis, uh, finite analysis, uh, simulation pro model. That is a simulation we'll talk about a little bit on another project I've got where if you have multiple systems that are building a product and all these parts are joining together, you've got inefficiencies of each one of those. You have to calculate how much inefficiency you're going to lose throughout that whole entire process to know how many parts you're going to build at the end of the day. So we'll run a full scale analysis on that, taking into account how long it takes to refill the machines, how many uh, expected downtimes you're going to have, what the time is between those downtimes. Um, all this will pay in, play into that simulation. Um, so here it talks about just different 
types of robotics we deal with, different types of equipment. Uh, I'm not going to read down through that. I think you guys are all proficient at that point. Um, just show some of our machining in-house that we have, and this is strictly at the Nashville site. Uh, we have a little bit of this in the other sites, uh, different locations also. Different controls-based platforms that we deal with. Um, you can see mostly we do a lot of Allen Braley, a lot of Siemens, back off equipment, and then all the baseline software to support that. This is kind of a rehash what we just spoke of, presses, standard automation, glove boxes, and isolation barriers. Glove boxes and isolation barriers you see a lot in uh, pharma, pharma industries and nuclear reclamation. And these are glove boxes that can be as large as this room with multiple access points with, that are truly just um, glove points that you can reach into the equipment through the isolation barrier through the gloves only. So there's a whole, it's quite a bit of effort to try to get that to go through. And when you're dealing with regulatory equipment, uh, there's lots and lots of specs to go with that and lots of paperwork to go with it. Um, here we're just giving a brief overview of some of the different projects that we've done. Uh, years ago when stents were first coming out, we helped develop a method of um, handling and the deposition processes of applying the stents uh, these little metal stents that you put into your, into your, um, your heart and your, your veins. To give you an idea, that's probably about two to three millimeters diameter, maybe 25 millimeters long. Uh, that was all handled on serv multiple servo systems, vision guidance, and lasers cutting out those little cobwebs that you see in there. Uh, this is one of my projects, an insulin pump project for insulate. Um, this project was actually building, what you see up there on the left, I'm sorry, on the right, um, is the pump itself. This is a wearable insulin pump that the user would fill with insulin every three days. And then it's programmed with a small PDA he carries with him. And that delivers a uniform insulin dosage over time. Um, so the body's able to absorb that insulin much red more readily than having a, um, what I call it, a base load, I believe. At the, at the end of the day. So for us, what we did was we built the, whole, we built the equipment that built the pod. Uh, took five different machines, uh, went into production, and then the customer 10 years ago decided to take it all to China. As of last week, they came back to us and said, that's really not working for us. The Chinese have increased their labor rates at a rate of almost 20% per year, and we're getting raped on all these little nickel and dime items. So they're now bringing it back to the States. So there's all these opportunities that are becoming back for us that we really need to you know, bring you guys out there as quick as possible and start fulfilling these needs. You're, I'm hearing that more and more though, lots of companies that are, have gone offshore are coming back and they don't have all, we don't have all the resources we need to fulfill this. So just keep, just keep medical products in your back pocket and think about that. Um, Colostomy bag assembly. Again, everything you can think of has to be assembled. Somewhere down the line, someone designed a machine for that. Inkjet cartridges, we supplied hundreds of machines at Hewlett Packard building inkjet cartridges. And all that went offshore, so it's starting, and it's starting to come back a little bit now. Um, just a assembly filter machine for automotive and diesel products. Contact lens processing, that's a very big industry in itself also. Um, all the contacts you guys wear is custom made for your requirements, right? So they've got a whole process for that and it's all, like full automated, all fully automated. That type of equipment, you can see that picture in the lower, the lower right. Um, I'll give you an idea, that's probably about 50,000 square feet of, of space and equipment it takes to do that. Again, FDA based, very clean, very high clean room requirements. Uh, more pharmaceutical fulfillment. This was a this is a storage and retrieval system. So there's a lot of companies now that are going away from your typical, you know, your mail order drugs that you have. 
Uh, there's huge factories out there that that's all they do, and that's what this was. This was a more like a library type system where the drugs are stored, then called out as needed to fulfill the the um, prescriptions as required. That's all highly automated. Vision inspection for uh, mold lens. This is part of the other line, just more storage and retrieval type equipment. Diagnostic test strips, again, more medical equipment, diabetics. Think about it, when you, when, I don't know if anyone's diabetic here, I hope you're not, but if you are, you're always testing your blood to see how much, what your sugar levels are. Every one of those requires a test strip. You do that a half dozen times a day, that ends up to be a lot of strips in a week, in a month. And now you've got that across, I, want, I think the number's like 20 million or so. Uh, our web handling systems, we have a whole group that does nothing but process equipment for web handling. Uh, that can be everything from threads to fibers to films. Um, a lot of these have to be heated rolls, very controlled rates of speed. This one machine is probably one of a dozen that's just as big as this um, and all tied together. Material handling. Um, to go along with all of your products that we're building, they all have to be packaged into something so that someone can get them on the grocery store, right? So all that has to be packaged and housed and then cartoned. This would just be one example of a scare type robot, I'm sorry, uh, six axis robot loading and unloading equipment. More web handling. This is on more on the micro scale though. This particular machine is about as big as this area in front of me. And this was making those uh, blood test strips. So it's laminating multiple strips, heating them, uh, bonding them all together, cutting them out into uh, small uh, ribbons, and then cutting them off to ends, and then collating each of those individual pieces and packaging them at a rate of probably, well, it says 1,280 minutes. So that's, that's flying. Uh, valve Stemley work. Uh, this is more from the automotive work or the uh, heavy off-road equipment. A um, lot of work out there for automotive if you want to get into that. We just, we build support equipment for that sometimes. And then ovens. Uh, for us, this goes along with the contact lens equipment. So as part of the process of that is, as those molds are filled uh, with a gelatin material to run through an oven, cured and then demolded at the other end of it. So that, what you're seeing in front of you is just the oven to run through that, just for the curing process. Blood sampling devices, again, the same type of things we were talking about for the blood strips. And then more build to print. Uh, again, this is customer comes to us, has a design that someone else built for him years ago, he wants to replicate it, we'll replicate it. A lot of people can build, they can buy the equipment but having somebody put it all together and make it all work and integrate it, that's a whole other challenge. A lot, of, a lot of small companies can't do. Uh, build to print, again, same type of thing. Uh, high speed continuous. Um, this would be more like a web line, but what you see here, are these bottles are being filled with that little desiccant pellet, uh, which is that little cylindrical device down in the middle of those pills. We were building the desiccant for that. So those things are running at 1,000 plus parts a minute, which means they're continuously moving and being filled as they move along through the system. And then we got uh, another company, Williams & White, with, that designs and builds presses that you see here. And they're into everything from even used for stamping, for molds. Um, plastics industry, automotive industry uses very large molds to you know, mold all those body frames, or, or I should say panels that you see. It's all part of it. Okay. Now, I don't know how to get out of this. Uh-huh.
Okay. The next project I'm going to talk to you about is uh, a new product coming out on the market that was announced last week. Uh, a lot of you guys probably play video games or have played, probably a lot more than I ever will. Uh, but this is by Valve Corporation, Valve uh, Software. They're coming out with a new controller that mates up with their equipment that's more for a PC-based equipment than it is for uh, your standard Xbox or something of that nature. So to go along with this though, our requirement is to build 10 of these a minute off of our line, put them into a box as you see here, load these batteries into it, close it all up, and then finally put a presentation sleeve into it along with some literature and things like that. Um, that part alone, which is simple as it looks, has over 43 parts within that. And the parts consist of the, the cases that you see, let me get this out of here, a bottom case, a top case, battery doors, all these little buttons that you see here, you've got a PCB board that goes along with that. You've got multiple parts assembled onto it, triggers on the front side that have to be moved and tested. Uh, battery holders that are built and loaded onto this and screwed and then soldered into place. All of these parts have to be presented in a manner that we can control at the rate that we need and then assembled in a manner that allows us to not stop the line, of course, if we have any issues. So to do this, um, we have 14 dials, 14 assembly dials that we use. But to go along with this, I just tried to give you a, a, a quick presentation as to what this is. The product was an immature product. They came to us and have never built these besides being built by hand. And at that time, they were printing, these, printing the plastic parts off, assembling them, testing them, and seeing if they liked them. This thing has been in the works for over four years. Um, since we've been involved for the last year and a, about a year, I've seen over four major revisions of this thing requiring completely new tooling on it. In some cases, I mentioned I had 14 dials. I had 14 dials up until a month ago, assembly dials, that now went down to 13. But some of that equipment went to China, so I'm still supplying it in one manner or the other. Along with this, we had a very quick delivery schedule required. We had to deliver this. Uh, it was supposed to be released for last Christmas. They didn't have it designed in time, so it gained me a little bit of time. But we had a design time of approximately uh, eight weeks to design all our engineering, which in a, pro uh, in a piece of equipment that's about a $25 million piece of equipment, this would normally take us twice that, if not more. So in order to handle that, we had engineering staff local. We had, uh, I had 40 some engineers and staff at, some t at any point. We were working across multiple sites and we had one, we even had our Singapore office working at some of this too. Uh, at the same time, the customer is continuously changing. So he kept changing his product. Uh, we were trying to keep up with him. Uh, we would be involved in design for manufacturing requirements meaning that we would get together on fo either on in face-to-face -face or WebEx requirements and uh, talk about how these parts were going to be assembled, what features could be removed, could be added to assist that. Um, all of the parts that we build, let's see if I can go down here a little bit more. This is the line that we built to do this. Each one of these, what you see looks like a, a little round circle, is an assembly dial. That's a 16 station assembly dial that looks like that. Um, to give you an idea, the size across the flats of that is about 80 inches. Um, it's servo driven, it has a very high accuracy, plus or minus two thousandths it can hold as far as holding the parts. And what we do is we'll load, bring the parts in, we'll use robotics to take the parts either out of trays, bowl feeders, other types of feed equipment, load them to these assembly nests, and then begin the progression as we go through this. To give you an idea, oh, we kind of start, can I use this pointer here? We kind of start over here on the right side and begin building the part up, and as it goes through each of these dials, we're accumulating more parts and more assembly steps. When we get to the middle, we stop, we stop and then from the opposite side, we've done the same thing with the other half of that. Bring those together, screw them together and then have to go through electronic testing 
and then finally down through the, the um, a testing sequence, adding more parts as we go along, and finally go through a full testing sequence out to packaging. But as we go through each one of these, on, on the right side, what you see zone A, zone A is doing nothing more than building this part here. So we've taken uh, a PCA, we've attached a double stick tape to this, we've located it with robotics and vision, guided it into so it's accurately located, and then placed it on top of here and then mash it down, made sure it's nice and tight so the tape's doing its job. And then we come back with vision and we verify everything we just did and verify that its coordinates are in the correct location. And we're gonna do that 43 different times or all these different parts all the way through here. Some of the other pieces that we built would be the trigger assemblies that we just, wow, I just cut myself, interesting. Um, the trigger assemblies themselves up on the other side. So this consists of, these are the front triggers that you see here on the front side. We build those up as individual assemblies. So you've got a base, two other plastic parts to go along with it, and a spring and a pivot pin in between all that. So we develop the means of holding all this on the dial. We'll load it in upside down. We'll build these other parts up, have robotics bring these in together and insert the pin with about 50 pounds of force. We'll then take those and assemble those to this PCB on the bottom side you see here. Then we'll screw those together. And again, all this is done with robotics. This line that you see here has almost 150 robots on it, has almost 29 vision applications with either vision guidance or vision inspection. We've got um, soldering applications on this. So now I've got to join, electrically join these um, say these battery holders up to this board. So we'll apply paste to that, we'll apply solder paste to that, and then we'll reflow those with lasers. So we use a, the lasers we use are really cool to watch, by the way. Um, these lasers have galvo heads, so which means that they'll it'll redirect the beam wherever you want it to be. And it will dance between eight points in about four seconds, and it'll, he it'll hit each point a hundred different times. So you're trying to hit that solder and melt it, but not make it explode. So you're trying to play a balancing act with that. So once you put all this together, now you're gonna insert it into, this is the upper half of that, which I didn't get to talk about yet, but you're gonna, you're gonna join this piece to this piece, and then you're gonna join the bottom half to this. To do this, this little flexible circuit here, is brought in, we, we find it with, with, again, with robots and vision. We insert that little tip into a little socket down here. You got about two thousandths clearance all the way around. You've got to hit, so you've got to use a six axis robot and hit it every time. We'll then come back and we'll hit that with solder and lasers again and bring it all together. And again, we're doing this at a rate, a very slow rate for us. This is about 10, 10 parts per, si uh, per minute, so it's six seconds per cycle. So it's very slow. Part of the trick to this, though, is how do you bring all these parts to this line? You've got 43 different parts. Each one's got to be introduced to this line in a controlled manner, and they all have to be repeatable every time. So what we do, we, I discussed we're using the, the ring dial assemblies that we built. So in order to get this done in the time frame we discussed, we have standards that we use, and the ring dial would be one of them, along with the robotics. Um, this just discusses more about the rotary indexer itself. So the rotary indexer will be fitted with tooling. Each tooling is dedicated to a particular uh, assembly process you're going through. We'll use conveying equipment to go between each of the dials so that each, as each assembly is completed and, uh, and built, it'll go to the next stage. We're using these conveying systems to do that. The dial itself is fitted with either a bowl feeder, a vibratory bowl feeder, or a tray feeder to bring these parts in. The trays will come in. This is just an SLA printing of one, one of the trays. The trays are actually about 19 inches long, and about 15 inches wide, and about two and a half inches tall. Or I'm sorry, about an inch and a half tall. And they're designed to hold these parts in a controlled manner so that we can come in with robots and pick them up every time. Again, it's repeatability is the trick for us. So what we do is we have these standard tray feeders that you see down here in the bottom fitted to each of these dials. 
and the operator comes in and is able to load a stack of these trays and then walk away for an hour to two hours before it exhausts that whole stack and he has to replenish it. So our tray feeder here. Um, to go along with that, since this customer didn't, he had a very, I mentioned a very immature product and they kept changing it. We knew they wouldn't have the plastics ready in time, meaning all these pieces. They wouldn't have them in time. So what we did was we fitted each of these dials where these tray feeders would be. We put what we call a little Lazy Susan dial. And this was designed such that the robots can load to it or if the plastics aren't gonna be ready, we pull the tray feeders away from the machine and then we can put an operator there and they can load that dial up all day long until those plastics are ready. So again, our, our goal was to get this machine ready um, and meet our schedule requirements. Uh, buffer dial philosophy, large tray feeder. So along with that, we had multiple sizes of these tray feeders. We have large, when you get to parts like this top case here, you can only fit so many of those in a tray. I think it's actually nine or 12 you can fit into a tray. Um, so in order to keep them not from having an operator stand there changing trays all day, we go to a very large tray and they can go for an hour or so before having to replenish them. All our equipment though, again, lots of servos, lots of robotics, um, a lot of safety guarding involved, trying to keep all these people uh, nice and safe. Two standard size robots we used on this project, a uh, small scare robot and a small six axis robot. To give you an idea, this scare robot from this point to this point isn't any higher than this. In some cases I got smaller ones that are about half that size. The six axis is maybe 25% larger. To go along with those, every one of those parts has to have custom means of picking it up, whether it be vacuum, whether it be mechanical grippers. Um, you have, all that has to be custom designed. Go back to the process itself. And this is just a breakdown as we go through each dial. Um, this slide set was actually made for a different group, but this just gives you an idea of all the different parts that we build as we go through each of these dials. Um, so for the dial A, we started with PCB and force reactors and then some foam pieces and the PSA that had to be attached to it. But the, again, that process is um, running under six second cycles, two parts per. And then as we go through, we just begin building that up. I'm not gonna bore you with going through each one of these pieces because it's definitely not as cool as going there while looking at the equipment. So then the second half, we begin just adding more parts, adding all these buttons so the buttons themselves add a little bit of a challenge because I glued all this in earlier. We have to verify that all these colored buttons are in the correct position, the correct orientation, and that they read correctly, that they didn't have a misprint on them. So again, we use vision. We'll pick these out of a tray. We'll place them over a camera. It'll do a color analysis. It'll verify what the orientation is and it'll look at radial and XY orientation. And then we'll compensate with the robots as we're loading them into these pockets for each one of these. These particular machines, these stations, run, they'll load four buttons within the um, six second time window. And doing that full analysis to go along with it. Um, Again, more plastic parts, more assembly. As we begin to build these, we, we begin to now stack them in together. Getting, they're getting larger. Uh, we're still using the same type of methodology for assembly though. Still the robotics and the assembly dials. Um, when we go to join these together at, here at, this center, at the center of the zone H, when we go to join these together, we got one station on there we call the magic station because it's truly uh, some magic that joins this together. So what you have is you have this, die, this part sitting here in a nest. Your requirement is to go in and grab each one of these flexible circuits and hold them in a vertical attitude. Find out where they are in X, Y, and Z locations in true space. And then join, insert each of those flexible circuits into this socket and this socket. And oh, by the way, those two don't match up when you begin to insert them. In an XY plane, they don't match at all. 
So what we do is we have, again, using the robotics, but we use some vision equipment that comes in and with a camera looks at horizontal and it splits the image. So we're looking at, we gather this force or this flexible circuit. We look at the tip of this. At the same time, we're looking at this socket. So we find the true X, Y locations. And we pull those cameras out of the way and then we begin the assembly process of bringing these two together. So in this case, we bring one side in, the robot does a side shift. We come in and we've already acquired this one. We'll do the same thing. But the tooling to make this happen probably takes, took longer to engineer this than it did two or three of the dials altogether. A lot of effort in that one. Um, we talked a little earlier about that trigger assembly. So there's just a breakdown of those parts that we had. And this, I kept telling you the customer had multiple changes. This is, these parts are completely changed three times over. It means all new tooling they had to buy. But uh, the battery holders themselves, we're looking at the bottom side, that's the assembly pieces that go with that. Again, all these individual pieces, but you gotta think about how you're going to handle them. How are they being presented to you? How are you, how are you what do you have to work with to put them together? Uh, this process, we had an antenna that had to be put in. The antenna is put in and soldered to the main board, again, with the laser equipment that we were speaking of before. More of the assembly work and the front case equipment. So now we're getting down towards the end. We're starting to bring all the final pieces together and we're assembling the major pieces. And we, just, we started building the bottom half of that, which has some levers into it that's built into it that they, they wanted to use to eject the batteries out. And then bring all the pieces together. To go along with this, you know, I mentioned earlier, let's see, go to one of these. I mentioned earlier that we run solid or, or process simulations. Um, and I mentioned earlier that to do this, you, the variables you have to take into account were all these different pieces coming into this machine. How many times have to be ref how many times do those machines have to be refilled? Is the machine going to be down during that time? Because all that's going to affect your end production at the end of the day. You have to look at how many times you expect that equipment to be down during the day. How many? What's your mean time between failure? How many operators do you have on the line? If you got operators, only two operators, and he has to access all that different pieces of equipment he's going to take a long time to respond to it. So we ran different simulations for them. And through that, we were able to optimize the number of operators they could use to get the max efficiency and able to estimate what our true production rates will be. Of course, you know, that was done months ago and it's all in theory, but it's our job to make it work now. So we'll get into, uh, we'll do a lot of that type of work also. Um, okay. That's what I have. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions, anyone? We will we will develop the robotics interface, all the all the uh, the movement paths, and the interface to the robots. We do the actual design of the robots. No, those are purchased all commercial. This particular project used all Epson robots. There's still, even though I, it, as a mechanical based guy, I just say, okay, I'm gonna place a robot there, I'm done with it. The controls engineer will come in there and he'll spend the next week getting it up and going. Mm -hmm. A little bit of both, yes. We're ensuring that we don't burn the PCB we don't explode the solder, so it creates, uh, get too hot and all the solder ball, the solder just explodes and blows solder balls everywhere. Um, at the same time though, you're trying to melt it at a controlled rate. So that you want it to flow down onto the contacts and the PCB, not anywhere else. So, and you have to do it within time frame. You gotta do it within that six second window. And by, when, I, when I tell you that, I'm actually telling you I'm putting a part out every six seconds but those first couple of machines that start out, they're running at sub five seconds. And out of the five seconds, you're gonna take about a half a second to index those parts in every time. So that, that takes away from your, your tack time. 
just lost it. Are, are you supported by a research lab that works out some of this material properties? We are not. We've done it. Have you discovered? Um, well, luckily we got some engineers been in a long time, for one. Um, and you kind of learn as you go, honestly. There are some, now we, we call ourselves more of a custom design house and integrator than anything. Meaning that if there's equipment out there that we can take from the industry, we will do that readily. Um, you know, some of this assembly type equipment has been done, it's been done before, but a lot of type of stuff has never been done and you're taking it on, you're taking it out on faith alone that you're gonna be able to do this. Did this product come to you already in production somewhere else? No. No, no, and this was an interesting product though because one of the things I really didn't cover through all this is the effort of um, working with the customer in design for manufacturing. We were not only working with the customer, we were working with um, a third party assembly company that was being hired to do the actual assembly itself. So this equipment will not go to my customer site, it will actually go to a third party site and they'll supply all the labor for that. So we were dealing with them, we were dealing with the customer and his design needs, we were dealing with sub-vendors that was gonna be supplying the circuit boards or the flexible circuits and things of that nature. Um, so lots of phone calls, lots of web meetings, early mornings, late at night when you're dealing with Asia and other places halfway around the world. Um, like I said, we've been doing it for a long time. There's, there's a path forward we can usually find. But it's never, it, it, the end machine never looks like you start with. We, the apps group will think it will be. Um, this customer, it, when I looked, I've got actually one of the models that they built the very first time. It looks nothing like that, that final product. As I understand, if you're a gamer, this is the one to own in the end. So come Christmas time, this will be on the shelf. So what's the typical demand for the young engineer like a mechanical or a work? So we've actually got a, had a couple of your interns. We've got one right now. We've had one last season. Um, typically, we'll bring them in. What, what, I am of the old school that I came from one of the last apprenticeship programs out of the area that I grew up in. And to me, there was a lot of knowledge I gained from working on the shop floor and assembling equipment and designing. Just things you'll never see sitting behind your desk or your computer. But for us, we tried to put, we tried to put the interns on the shop floor for a few months, get their feet wet that way, and then bring them in board inside and start them out with light detailing working behind other engineers and acting as a support staff member. And then as they progress, we'll bring them into taking on some light design work, uh, working with a project engineer or another manager as required. But there's always, they'll always have a support person there for that, pur for that purpose. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but. It, well, the bottom line is it's all the same. It's just bigger equipment. Um, it really comes down to what's your regulatory requirements? What's the specifications? If you're dealing with automotive, if they're got automotive, they'll have their own set of standards they want built to. You've got to match that. But you're still moving parts from A to B. They're coming in bulk. You're breaking them down. You're singulating them. You're orienting the way you need it to assemble it into another part. You're gonna be doing some testing. You gotta verify that part was loaded. You gotta verify that after you've loaded, it meets a particular requirement, whether it's pressed to a requirement, whether it is clocked so the gear teeth may match other gear teeth. Um, it, it, the process is, is initially the same. It's just the size of the equipment. I kind of mentioned the solar cell line that we were working on. Um, where the customer wanted the factory, we broke down. So to give you an idea, these rotary dials were about 35 foot in diameter. Um, 
and they had to be broke down for quick disassembly, moved to a new site in the desert so they could build, begin erecting the next solar cell farm. They wanted to be able to build solar cells right on site versus building them in a factory halfway around the world and shipping them over. So that thing was, is exactly, exactly the same type of process, just bigger scale. Anything else? Today, I want to thank you again for coming out.